You know, Doyle, it's really lonely around the holidays. Just us two. Normally, we've got a full set. It looks like somebody's missing. Yeah, I mean, these guys, all the Adrian Heath gnomes, are staring right here. What's supposed to be here? You think we just throw another? Yeah, just throw another. Okay, well, Doyle, David, and Adrian Heath, we're going to host the show. Just kidding. We've got a surprise host coming up next. Welcome, everybody, to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T Studios in Manhattan, our final live show of 2019. I'm David Goss. Andrew Reby is currently en route to Kansas with a two-year-old on a plane, so Godspeed to him and all you're doing. I dragged Matt Doyle in for one last show. And this man right here, the legend from MLS, Darius Barnes, former defender, New England Revolution great, joining us. No, thank you for having me. It's this, good to be on the show. This is what you've strived for your whole career, right? That's what I've been waiting for. This it's, is the moment. Taking all the baby steps in my career. To As a here. kid, you're like, one day I will play professional soccer so I could then go on Extra Time Radio. No, I just, I, I, I'm giddy right now. I don't know what to say. So when, when you were playing, how many players in the locker room, like what percent, listen to Extra Time Radio? Whoa. That's a big question to start the show right? with. I got to put them on the spot. That is. Point three. Point nice. three percent. <laughs> okay. You guys, that's a big jump from we were at point two before. So we're growing, which is what we want to see. And I like to th consider us the, you know, the triple D combo. Mm. David Doyle and Darius. Let's go. Yeah, you don't have a first name, so it's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I think most people know you that anyway. Yeah, that's when your wife calls true. you Matt, it confuses me because I didn't know I thought she's married to two people. <laughs> and I'm always looking for that Matt guy. Does Megan call you Dave or David? David. And very specifically. Okay. Yeah. There's no nicknames, there's no anything else. Mm -hmm. It's very off putting when people call me other things. <laughs> Drink Lord. Yeah, yeah. It's all business, you know, it's all professional. We've got a great show today. A lot happening because the season never ends. We have a new Major League Soccer franchise that has officially been announced in your home state of Charlotte, North Carolina. So you're going to give us the North Carolina expertise because we've just been blowing, you know, hot air about it for the last <laughs> three, four weeks. Have you been to the state of North Carolina? I, yeah, I've been through it and I've flown through it, but I've never. I don't know that flying through something counts. Okay, well then no. Yeah. Well, I've driven through it. Okay. Yeah. But and we'll give you we'll give you the world too. Yeah, he'll he'll give us the real experience. Then. Yeah. I think that might be a little bit better. We've got some news coming in Chicago as we head into the big part of the off season, which we're very excited about. We also have rumors of one of the biggest signings in Columbus Crew history, and we've got what it looks be the like the biggest signing. Well, I don't want to throw it down there if it hasn't happened yet. Right, it's rumor of the biggest okay. sign reports of the biggest signing. Give it some wiggle room in Columbus Crew history are. It, the report is the signing is imminent. Okay. If it were to happen, it would be the biggest signing. And if it doesn't happen, it would no. It wouldn't be the biggest signing. There you I go, think David. that's. A, I think that's decent math, and it could also set them up to be one of the best starting lineups in Major League Soccer. We've got our national TV and TV schedules, as the schedules has released for the 2020 MLS season. We're going to talk about that. We're very excited. Plus, all your questions, rumors, transfers, all that stuff going on. So let's get started with. The biggest news, Charlotte awarded the 30th franchise in Major League Soccer. David Tepper, the head of the ownership group, also the owner of the Carolina Panthers, since 2018. The team will start playing 2021 at the Bank of America Stadium, which is the home of the Panthers in Charlotte. They will start in 2021 alongside Austin. And then, of course, St. Louis and Sacramento are coming in in 2022 because that is it. The expansion uh, pack is done. The cap that, that, is on. That caught me off guard. That, when that the commissioner is it? said that, in, in the, I think he said it first to ESPN, mm -hmm. and I saw that headline come up, and I like threw that at the editorial chat. I was like, "Do we actually have we heard this before?" But he he was adamant. This is it, thirtieth and in. He has doubled down on it multiple times since then. But let's start with thirty. Let's not talk about the other expansion. Our stop. This is a, this is a big moment. This is for an area that is famous for its soccer from its grassroots up. The college soccer, of course, is probably the cream of the crop around the country, throughout the state, and multiple professional franchises, as well as two-time women's now NWSL champions. Uh, what does this mean to your home state? What does this mean to North Carolina? This is huge. This is huge. I mean, I, I grew up going to Raleigh Flyers games in, in the A-League, you know, if, if – <laughs> I might have dated myself a little bit with, with that one, but like that, this is huge to have a, a major league soccer team um, in my home state of North Carolina. Um, I, I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, it's my home state. I'm, I'm from Raleigh, so tech, not technically from Charlotte, but uh, it's all the same. You know, we're, 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 we're the South. We're the South, and I think uh, you couldn't have picked a better market 
um, you know, to represent MLS and to start a franchise. They have, you know, all the resources. Tepper's going to, you know, put his mind, heart, soul into this club. And I think, um, I really think they're going to hit the ground running. He seems like he has very high ambitions. And, you know, the, the youth soccer in North, in North Carolina is, you know, the pinnacle. You know, there's, you know, so much talent there. He's going to have so much, you know, talent to choose from in the backyard to, to start the academy. Um, you have some, you know, great youth soccer clubs down there already um, in Charlotte Soccer Academy. Uh, you have Charlotte Independence. And then uh, down the road in Raleigh, you have North Carolina FC, um, who actually, you know, merged together with, you know, an elite powerhouse of, you know, Castle, who's, you know, known around, around the globe, uh, around the United States for being a powerhouse in youth soccer. And they merged with my former club, Triangle Football Club. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's a massive win for the state, massive win for, you know, the cities in the state to really have something to hold on to, to call your own. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I think they're going to blow it out the water. What's the soccer culture like? Because you mentioned that youth ranks, and I think we all know those clubs that you mentioned. I grew up going to tournaments down there. It felt like every kid that comes out of North Carolina, men's and women's, plays soccer. What is the culture like? What's the game going to be like? Yeah, I mean, it's just – it's it's invigorating. It's exciting down there. Every kid in North Carolina, you know, plays soccer, and you know, you you really wouldn't think that. You really wouldn't think. Um, everybody kind of asks, like, why does North Carolina produce so you much would think soccer basketball talent? Basketball and football, yeah. right? Yeah, which we have that too. Yeah. We have that too. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a little bit of it all. Um, but there's there's so many great athletes that are produced from North Carolina, um, and I just think it's a it kind of speaks to the the culture of North Carolina, just what it is. It's a you know Southern hospitality. Um, you know, middle class families who, you know, want the best for, for their families, for their kids. And, you know, they want to, you know, find escape and find, find an outlet and find a route for them to, you know, for them to succeed and for kids to enjoy and have fun. And, you know, everywhere you look, there's a soccer field in North Carolina and kids are playing, you know, day in and day out on the weekend. Um, and I think that's really what, you know, families, you know, held on to, especially as I was growing up. A kid, his name is Zach Adams, who ended up being one of our best friends. Um, and his dad ended up being my first soccer coach and just, you know, asked me if I wanted to come, you know, play recreational, then asked me to come try out for a team, ended up making a team called the Nightdale Bad Boys. Ooh, which, <laughs> that's a name. We're, 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 we're really, really going back there now. <laughs> Branding opportunity for the new team. Oh, man. <laughs> Was Will Bad Smith Boys. on the team or Martin Lawrence? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite movies, though. Yeah, there you go. It's yeah. coming. They're making a oh, new one. Man, I can't wait. I can't oh, wait. Um, I'm glad we got this in. <laughs> I got we got a bad boy segment. Nightdale bad boys, and just to go back a little bit, uh, Michael Harrington mm -hmm. uh, was one of my teammates. One of my teammates nice. back in the day. So MLS it just kind of champion. Yeah, yeah. It just, so it just kind of speaks to you know some of the talent that's been developed. Uh, me and Ico Parr played for the same club, you know, growing up, and obviously you see what he's doing in the league now. <laughs> uh, Two-time MLS Defender of the Year. So. Um, I just think, you know, you know, seeing players like that come into the league and do what they have done and have the success and uh, of achievements they've had, you know, really speaks to the quality of play that's down there and the quality of talent that's in North Carolina. Let's talk about the city itself. And, and I know you're a Raleigh guy, but you've obviously been to Charlotte a few times and you're better acquainted than probably most of our listeners are. When Atlanta came in, um, there were real questions about will the South embrace soccer? And obviously they've done it in spectacular, literally record-breaking fashion. Is Charlotte just kind of a smaller Atlanta, or is it a different type of culture in the town? I feel like there, there, there are similarities, and there's, you know, they have their differences as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think to compare it directly with Atlanta would be, would be a high expectation. Um, I think it's very unique in... It has so many different, you know, cultures down there, and um, it, it's a growing city. It's a booming city. I think, you know, from a fan demographic standpoint, they're going to be able to capture, you know, a lot of different audiences, being that um, you can capture, you know, Raleigh. You can go down south, get kind of some of North Georgia as well. You can reach into Tennessee a bit. Um, and also just the, the commercial opportunity that they're going to have in, in North Carolina. Um, it's a hotbed. Um, uh, it's a financial hotbed. So I think they're going to be able to kind of use their commercial resources to really tap into and, you know, elevate the community and elevate the sport um, from a technical and, you know, commercial standpoint. So I think it, it's, it's going to be a unique city and they're going to kind of they're going to have to find their niche a little bit. You know, Atlanta really leaned into the, the hip hop urban demographic, as you can see with their fan culture and um, how they've elevated that into the or incorporated that into their, their fan experience and their game day experience. I don't think Charlotte's going to, 
you know, they have to find something very organic and authentic to them. And I think with, with the group that Tepper is putting in place, um, I think he'll figure it out. They're going to they're gonna be creative. They're going to be innovative. Um, you can see, you know, you know, early on commissioners, like we're not going to let any teams in without a stadium. But I'm sure Tepper's, you know, <laughs> had his innovative thinking in terms of how they want to build their stadium and uh, renovate Bank of, America, uh, Bank of America Stadium. So I think, you know, the resources that he's putting together and the team he's putting together are going to find a way to really get it done. One of the things you've talked about on this show, and I think Merritt Paulson's name has come up, is active owners, owners yeah. who are engaged, help build that fan base. David Tepper sounds like he's pretty engaged. He's ready to go. He's <laughs> not going to be quiet. He's ready to party. He was out at the bar all night with these fans, buying drinks and giving speeches and, and celebrating. And he seems like he's going to be what you've been asking for, which is an engaged owner who wants to push the, the league forward. I mean, you put 325 on the table <laughs> up front. You better, you better be engaged. And by the way, it does seem like it's resonated. Uh, Tom Glick, the uh, the president of the Panthers said on local radio there that they sold 7,000 season ticket deposits in the first 24 hours. Like, they don't even have a team name yet, and they got 7,000 season de- ticket deposits. I think those convert to, it. like, 99% of those people actually buy season tickets. Um, they're probably over 10,000 as we're talking, because it's another six hours after that. Um so, it, it, Darius, your family should get on. Yeah, right. <laughs> they should get on the get phone in now. I mean, it's crazy because as um, soon as the team was announced and, you know, I kind of retweeted it and uh, reposted it on my Instagram. And I'm getting messages from, you know, some of my, you know, former high school teammates, former, you know, uh, people that I grew up with that some I haven't talked to in, in ages. And they're like excited about, you know, Charlotte coming into town and throwing the fire emoji. And they literally haven't, you know, played a, played a game or stepped foot on the field. So, that just shows uh, you know, the influence that it's going to have, the influence that you know Charlotte's had, and you know they're excited. So I'm excited with them. Do you expect the team to? I know we're far from this, but like no, no, this is perfect because I'll say this: uh, Brian Abernethy from Charlotte emailed us and said he's been following the league, listening to our show for years. He says today my city finally gets its own franchise. The excitement is real. The emotions are heavy. I can't wait to hear the ETR gang discussing Charlotte for years to come, but I'm mostly just excited to feel a part of this crazy world of MLS, which is perfect because now we're going to overestimate and challenge them three years before we should, which is ETR 101. Yeah, absolutely. So they, they don't have a coach yet, which I think is troubling. Now, Doyle, you go. But would you, would you expect them to go in the Atlanta or inter Miami direction and look to Latin America? Or do you think that the culture in the Carolinas is more about looking across the pond and, and getting guys, you know, their own version of what Wayne Rooney was for DC or what Thierry Henry was for the Red Bulls back in the day? I think, I think they're, they're going to want to just build a winner. They're mm-hmm. going to want to build a winning franchise. I think Tepper even, uh, you know, in the announcement said, we want to win MLS Cup. And he, he seems like he wants to win right away. Like, he wants to come in. He doesn't want to, you know, baby step it and, you know, kind of evaluate and see everything. He wants to try to come in and win right away. So I think they're going to put a product on the field that competes from day one. Um, I think they will – they'll be smart about their signings. I I do think they'll lean into Latin America. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they'll have a strong Latin American fan base. And, obviously, they'll have – they'll have a strong community fan base, those who are, you know, native to, to North Carolina and Charlotte. But I think they're going to be smart about about their signings. They'll you know make the DP splashes when they need to. Um, they'll you know I think I think the academy is going to be huge for obviously speaking early about the hotbed of talent and the, the natural talent that's already there and um, the coaches that are there and the exposure that those kids are going to get. And um, I think they're going to build the right infrastructure to to bring those academy kids through the through the process and through the program. So I think they're going to check every single box. Um, but it, it, obviously it all depends on what, what Tepper invests into it and, you know, how he sees it fit. But I think um, it, it's, it's going to be amazing. I think it's, they're going to hit the ground running. One of the things that's interesting with all the names you've said of all the soccer royalty from the state is, like, who's going to be a part of building this? Because a lot of times you see someone who's local come back and be a part of GM, president, whatever Are you, are you campaigning for Darius to, to be GM of, of the new Listen, my new only Carolina campaign team? is apparently some Carolina bad website. Boys? 
some rag website called MLSsoccer.com put out some article about the best players in North Carolina history, and my man wasn't in the starting lineup. Wow. Beat out by guys like Eddie Pope and Ike Opara? Come on. Who, who are these guys? Just who garbage guys? defenders. I believe they both went to better schools than Darius did, though. Ooh. I mean, Wake Forest. <laughs> Carolina. UVA, UVA, yeah. Duke. I think we could all trash on UVA <laughs> together and just we'll all share in that experience. Not that I have anything against it. Yeah, but why, why do you have anything against UVA? I'm always in favor of being against things. Okay. I think that's a positive way for me to live my life. Okay. I like to be involved. Uh, Brian Abernathy closed his email out with thanks for all you do, dot, 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 except Doyle. So I just want to get that in there because <laughs> I think you've basically followed every theme he wanted. You've overestimated them early and now you've been thanked for it. Or not. So I appreciate Brian. I I appreciate everyone in North Carolina and welcome if you're new to the show. And South Carolina. They're probably going to be branded as Carolina something, right? They're probably not going to be North Carolina something. I was I was having this conversation with a in a group chat with a couple of my, a couple of former players and a couple of buddies of mine, and uh, we have no idea. Yeah, we have no idea. Like they could go. No, they could go Charlotte. They could go like Charlotte. It sounds City. like there's a chance yeah, yeah. Charlotte is in the name. Charlotte. That's pretty good actually. Yeah, Charlotte Monarchs. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad, right? I don't know what it, it's, it's also like. It wasn't one of the ten names that was registered. Right, yeah, so. yeah. like Queen City, but that's like yeah. F stick. Get confused also, with FC Cincinnati, Cincinnati a little yeah, bit. Like yeah. all these cities have so many different <laughs> names, and nobody knows where they came from. Um, whatever it is, we are excited about it. And anyone who's new, welcome. And the world of Major League Soccer is wild and wacky and fun, and we are glad to have a new, you know member in it and coming in 2021 will be the Charlotte MLS team, whatever the name is alongside Austin. And then as we said, St. Louis and Sacramento will come in after that. Why then we will have 30 teams. So we have conference alignment emails. Do you guys want to do that? Oh, dive right in. Uh, so we've talked a lot about how you'd align the East and the West. What about five divisions of six teams each? That's right? what the NBA does, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, each conference has three divisions. But the divisions don't actually matter much in the NBA. So this, the recommendation here is you would play each team in your division twice for 10 games, leaving one game each against the remaining 24 teams for 34 games. Sold. Sold. Done. <laughs> Do you want any division breakdowns? Do you want yeah, to hear one? Yeah, give, give us the division. Our, our guy Jeff was the one who sent this email in. East was Montreal, Toronto, New England, Red Bulls, NYCFC, and Philly. That's a clean one. Uh, Midwest... I don't. I don't like DC not being in. That's that's like that's okay. a tough one. Well, right it there. starts to get unclean. Then you've yeah. got Midwest is Columbus, Cincinnati, Chicago, Minnesota, KC, and St. Louis. You've got the Pacific. Okay. That's a good one. Which is LAFC, Galaxy, San Jose, Sacramento, and then trying to shoehorn here. You get RSL and Colorado to try and keep them together. Then you get creative with a West division, which is Portland, Seattle, Vancouver. Dallas, Houston, and Austin to That's, try and keep them together. Now it's ugly. And the South is, makes sense where you start with Orlando, Miami, then you've got Charlotte and Atlanta, then you've got Nashville, and then you've got D.C. It's close. It's, yeah. tough. it's close, but it's tough, right? Yeah. It sounds like we need four more teams. In our- <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, five, whatever the division I like is. East and West. Yeah. Right? I like East and West. No matter what, even if there's a ton of teams, are you okay with a situation where East doesn't even play West until the MLS Cup or playoff? That's what USL does, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I'll say I'm not okay with that. Like, there has to be East-West play. And figuring out how to balance it is going to be a monster task yeah. for whoever has to do that across mm-hmm. the street. One of the things I'm completely comfortable with, real quick, and I'm going to throw this out, is the idea of, like, College sports, when you create your own schedules, where it's like there's an opponent you will always play. Like if Nashville and Atlanta, if, um, you know, Red Bulls, for some reason, Red Bulls and D.C. aren't in the same division, conference, right. whatever, and you have an unaligned schedule where you don't evenly play everyone over the course of five years so that you play every year, I'm okay with that. I think that's one of the necessities of this whole thing. It's like you have set rivalries that have to exist, and if you have some floating schedule where you're there's supposed to be – like this year, three teams that you don't play, mm-hmm. it should never be those teams. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people will be upset about that, but I'm okay with it. Speaking of that, we have our schedule for 2020. So everyone's got their calendars out. This is Darius taking out his calendar. <laughs> Doyle's probably going to use an app. He's going to be tech savvy. Here's our calendar right here. Uh, we have huge news. National TV schedule, 36 games over the air, including eight in Canada, it's CTV, 10 on ABC, 
We've got four on Big Fox, 14 on Univision, 20 on ESPN, one on ESPN2, and then 30 on Fox Sports 1, and 18 on Unimas. 10 games on ABC. You've got 34 games for every team, 17 home, 17 away. You play everyone in your own conference twice, 10 out-of-conference opponents, and then there are three opponents that each team won't play. There's an article on MLSsoccer.com that has each team and the three they won't play. So you can go there if you want to figure that out, and you can go there to read Andrew Weeby's article about all the games he's excited about for all the reasons that he gets excited for things which are always odd and Narrative-driven. Narrative. Very narrative-driven. Um, so you take a look at this schedule. It comes out. We've got you know a couple big ones. I think we, we mentioned when the uh, season openers came out. You've got Nashville opening up against Atlanta. That's going to be pretty cool as someone who's from the area. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a big opportunity. That's going to be a big opportunity to, to kind of stamp that that Southern rivalry. Um, and obviously with more, you know, Southern teams coming into it, kind of, you know, might be an opportunity to create some kind of Southern Cup, if you will. So, Ooh. Yeah. Do you have a name? The Grits Cup. <laughs> the Grits. Ooh. Like, I was thinking more of like a barbecue cup, but Grits is good. You know? Darius came to play here. He did. I respect yeah, I mean, that. I love a nice bowl of Grits. So. I've never had Grits that I've enjoyed, but I'm from the North. What? Yeah. I ch- I've never experienced. Do you do cheese? Is that I'd, the key? All right. Here, okay. A little butter. Yeah. Salt, pepper, sprinkle of cheese. Okay. Some people do the sweet grits, like they sprinkle sugar and they like the sweet and savory. I'm all savory. Okay. Straight savory. Okay. And you do shrimp and grits, right? Love shrimp and grits. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Fritz Cup. I, do they do grits in, in Nashville, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. Atlanta. How are you Atlanta. asking these questions? This man's the expert. Uh, that's why I'm asking, because he's the expert. Atlanta does grits. Uh, we went to, I was at uh, in North Carolina this past weekend for the Adidas MLS College Showcase. And we took a Leco uh, out to, you know, just a little little diner. Um, he had grits for the first time, so I was able to introduce him to grits. So I, I love introducing people to grits who've never had them. Okay, well, then that's something we're going to have to do together. Yeah, right. Let's do it. Uh, outside of that big home opener, we've got LAFC, LA Galaxy, two times on national TV, one on ABC, one on Fox. And if anyone remembers what happened last year, that one's probably going to break every record Mm -hmm. for MLS viewership. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. No, for sure. Like El Trafico has um, always delivered. And yet it's like fifth on my list of things that, I mean, I, I, I can't wait to see Inter Miami play. I know they don't have a coach. I know they only have half a roster at this point. Um, half a stadium. Half a stadium. But they, like, it's, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, what they're going to do with it because I think they're going to be LAFC or Atlanta level right out the gate. Obviously, the time frame is getting pretty narrow on that actually coming to pass, but they still have two open DP slots, and they still have almost all of their allocation money, um, and they still have a ton of flexibility. I like so I'm looking forward to you know the first couple of games that uh, that Inter Miami play, but in particular. Inter Miami versus Orlando, like that, like poor Orlando City. They didn't even get to be a rival with Atlanta because they haven't. They they just haven't won a game against them. Like it feels like this is, year is going to be kind of a, a reset for them, and they're going to get to reset their team as a legitimate regional rival comes in for them. So it's exciting, like for the entire state of Florida, that should be exciting. See, I, I somewhat disagree with you on Inter Miami. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see them play. I'm thrilled. I, I get all the buzz, but the longer time goes on, the less and less optimistic that they're going to be a LAFC or Atlanta United. Just I think they have so much to do in such a short period of time. Um, I think they're acquiring players, not knowing you know the coaching style, the tactics that are going to be used. So I'm not saying it can't be done, but. I was on. I was on board with you from from the start, from the jump, and then as time goes on, I, I think they're going to le- need a little bit more time to kind of, you know, integrate themselves in MLS. Yeah, it's well, December nineteenth. They still don't have a coach. So yeah. Well, our weekly drop of the Athletic, Paul Tenorio, had an article about Nashville and Inter Miami building, and Paul McDonough, who is going to be running or is running into Miami, specifically pointed out you guys and said, all the media heads who think they know everything, they think we're behind, they have no idea what's going on. So uh, he disagrees with you guys. And apparently January 1st is the new date we're going to learn 
the new manager. So that will be the next one that will blow right through until we get the actual <laughs> guy. But I hope this, they prove me wrong. I yeah. hope they do too. Uh, March 14th will be their home debut. That one, of course, will be against the LA Galaxy, one we're very excited about. And, of course, the big ones to put on your calendar, Heineken Rivalry Week, August 20th to 23rd. A lot of big games, some new rivalries coming in. Uh, I think Nashville plays FC Dallas that week, so Nashville's got to start to grow their rivalries across the league. And then Decision Day, presented by AT&T, will be on October 4th. And it was a pretty good one this year, guys. So oh, yeah. we have a lot to live up to, but I think the last two weeks this year showed what it could be. And now you add two more teams, you got more going on, it's going to be pretty fun. Definitely, definitely. I think, um, you know, I, I really love Decision Day this year. I think know that so much is at stake. Um, and obviously having those games on national TV, too. That if actually... you played, would you enjoy it or would you hate not knowing what was going on in the other games? I mean, I think that raises the stakes a little bit, right? That that keeps the game honest. That that makes you, you know, know that there's something to actually pay, play for. That adds pressure to you. That adds, you know, a little bit of bite to, you know, to that game and meaning to that game. So I, I would have no – I had no problems with having that pressure on me you know, when it, when it comes down to it, that's, that's, that's what they pay you the big bucks for. <laughs> that's how we felt on decision day. Just, Absolutely. just trying to consume it all. Yeah. It felt like a lot of pressure. It, it actually did, but you know, <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. Doyle, I'm here for you. I broke. Yeah. It's you, okay. You're almost on vacation. Yeah. You're almost at that. Uh, so that's the, your whole schedule. You can go to MLS soccer.com. Also, I highly recommend going basically to every team in MLS's Twitter feed at this point and watch their videos of how they release their schedules. Cause they are, Hilarious and creative across the board. As usual, Galaxy killed it, DC United, Red Bulls. I don't want to leave anyone out, but I left a bunch of people out. Chicago you Fire. Just, you just named three of 2016. Four, four no. Four I, I got worried because then I was like, oh, now I got to name all 26 if I keep going. Those are some of the ones I noticed on the way into the studio. So those are some of the ones I'm pointing out. But all of them have been good. Speaking of the Chicago Fire, though, good thing I got that one in. Mm, nice uh, segue. Rumors are that they are close to hiring a sporting director. Um, a Swiss native who was the sporting director for FC Basel from 2009. You could call them reports at this point. They're not rumors. Ah, uh, and the differences? Uh, a credible journalist sources it, then, then it's a report. Oh. If it's some, you know, Twitter egg, then it's a rumor. So, like, if someone like you says it, it's a rumor, but if a real it, yeah, journalist... Yeah, exactly, <laughs> cool. exactly. Uh, did Paul or Sam say it? I think Sam. Okay, then we're good. Journalists are reporting George right. Heights. There you go. Uh, <laughs> George Actually, Heights. it's Sam. It's a rumor. <laughs> bird dog. Out there, bird dog. And George Heights will, would be the sporting director for the Chicago Fire. He would report directly to Joe Mansueto, the new owner, and then he would proceed to build out the front no, no, office. No, wait. This is from Paul. So this is a report. Okay. Yeah. Reported no, I think. Okay. Whatever. We'll go back and forth on this one. Rumor report. Uh, uh, so here, this is what we're hearing. Let's start with if this was to be the way this goes down, let's say Paul or Sam is right for the first time in their lives mm -hmm. and this happens. Is this a good move? Is this what you're hoping for? Is it just like it's time, let's start moving anyway? It doesn't really matter. It, I mean, at the very least, it's that last one. Like they, they need like, – this was, you know, two months ago, Nelson gave – Nelson Rodriguez gave his, his postseason Q&A and he said, I'm stepping away from – the sporting side of things, we have to break this off. Where one, you know, one half does business and one half does sporting, and it's taken two and a half months to get the the sporting side, um, not not even officially confirmed, but it at the very least this is a step. FC Basel, I can't claim to have watched a, a ton of them or any of the Swiss league. I've only ever seen them play in Europa League and occasionally Champions League. Which, by the way, under Heights, they were extremely successful. Right, they round got round 16, 16 a couple twice. twice. Yeah. Shakiri came through, Mohamed Salah. A lot of the... Basically, they won eight titles in his nine, eight year, nine years. So yeah, so he... They were pretty good. He seemed to have a, a lot of success, and um, that's obviously a good point on the CV. And the other thing is, MLS teams are, are doing this because MLS teams are... And by doing this, I mean hiring sporting directors or GMs from overseas because MLS teams are becoming more and more interested, not just in importing talent, but in having those networks to sell talent overseas. And FC Basel has sold a lot of talent over the past 10 or 15 years. Um, so if Chicago signs Mauricio Pineda from UNC and he's amazing and they can sell him for $3 million to Basel or to Azad Alkmaar or something like, like this guy 
has those contacts. So it makes sense in that regard. The area where it's, I don't want to say concerning, um, but like you also understand why so many teams have looked in the direction of Latin America recently. Because so many, like the, the future the future of this league is not just the United States of America and Canada, but it's Latin America. Like we have to be the best league in the Americas. That means having those contacts there as well. So you wonder what the rest of the staff is going to end up looking like the front office staff. I mean, is going to end up looking like for the, uh, the Chicago fire. But I mean, on the face of it, this is like, it looks like a very good hire. So let's say that this is what happens. You've got three DP spots open, which is pretty rare. You're moving into a new stadium. You've rebranded. Do you go aggressive in 2020? And we've got Jamison M., who apparently we convinced to be a Chicago Fire fan, so you're welcome, and he wants to know what you think. Do you go aggressive or sort of, and we're about to talk about Columbus, do you take your time to build yourself out and maybe push in 2021 or in the summer? Yeah, I mean, I think the good thing is he has a blank canvas to work yeah. with, you know, um, but you have to get it right. You have to you have to get it right. Move it at the Soldier Field. Um, you're trying to reinvigorate that fan base. You know you re, you've rebranded, um, so you've taken a lot of those you know first initial steps to kind of revamp the organization. So I think I think it's a multifaceted approach. I think it's a dual approach and a hybrid of the two, in terms of you know you, you go out and do your homework and you bring someone who's going to be, you know. He's going to be a value and an asset and a contributor right away. But I don't think they need to go out and make a huge splash and, you know, get three big name players right away. Um, they've tried to you know, tried to do that and kind of backstep and backtrack a little bit um, when they signed you know, Schweinsteiger. Obviously, he had a he had a great career and did, did great things for Chicago. But I think that was more of a kind of a, a panic move, uh, if you will. Um, I think they definitely need to be more strategic. And if they could obviously, you know, lean into, you know, the resources, I think you you hit it big when you talk about the network of bringing in some of these uh, uh, foreign sporting directors in terms of, you know, having those assets and having those contacts abroad to, you know, buy and sell players. I think as MLS becomes more of a selling league, having those contacts is going to be absolutely monumental, but also, to, to, to find and seek talents and to have those contacts with, with scouts to evaluate talent, I think that's going to be huge for Chicago. So I really think, you know, them separating uh, the kind of the, the sporting and commercial side a bit helps them out so they can don't spread themselves too thin and really have the proper focus to go out there and identify talent and put out the best product on the pitch. Let me help them. Chicharito. Look, I've just identified talent for the Chicago <laughs> Fire. Like uh, he's he's still playing in La Liga. He signed a, a three-year deal with, with Sevilla, um, but he's not playing much. And it, we all know it would take a monumental effort to to get it done. But he's still worth it. He's thirty-one. So would you do it now or for the summer and have? I would a do it. Season. I would do it right now. I would get Chicharito. Um, I would then go for. Uh, I, I would go for a young sort of what Miguel Almiron was, level DP out of South America. And the third one, I probably just look for, like, you, you got to find, like, you got rid of Dax McCarty. Yeah, you you got to find a D-mid. Yeah. Do you it, do, no, do you go three DPs off the yeah, bat? I do. Yeah? Yep. I, I absolutely would. If, because, and you said it. You only get one chance at this. They're moving back downtown. They have to reinvigorate this fan base. Um, and Chicago's... Um, it, like Chicago's a, a big city, and you can get lost really easy in a big city if you don't have big names. Um, this isn't like you know, like like Portland or you know Kansas City, where like being the local club can mean it. Because in Chicago, it's ten million people, and everybody has something different to do. So I think I honestly think they have to go out and they have to to get you know a player whose name is bright neon lights, 12 feet tall, and, like, everybody knows, like, oh, this team is serious. But the thing you want to be careful of is the Schweinsteiger example of you do it, but the team around it's not ready. Now you get people to come. What does it look like rather than do you build a little bit and then in the summer you bring guys into a more established roster where you're ready to be good when people come in the building I get, at a big time? I, Whether you make the playoffs then or not is another question, but you have that run to push people. I, I get what you're saying, but at this point I don't – like I think the margins are that thin 
for Chicago because the last thing you want to do is get to Soldier Field, yeah. lose your first five games, score four goals, and everybody in Chicago is already like, click. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I it's think- an it's an interesting situation because yeah. there's a lot to like if you're coming in as a sporting director because of the blank canvas, as you said, that you have. There's a lot to do. There's also a great soccer history there. The club has a great history, which you can kind of rely on and lean back on in terms of hiring people who have contacts in Central yep. and South America, who have worked in the U.S. soccer circles. It's a world city. And on top of all that, you've got all of these backgrounds that you can draw from. And as you said, Chicharito. Chicharito will get people in the building anywhere in the U.S., but mm-hmm. you've got options like a Lewandowski, as we've talked about, where you have those backgrounds. Well, he's had a poor season. Yeah, so yeah, he's been he, lousy. He's got 30 goals so far <laughs> midway through the year, I think. So it's a possibility. On the flip side, if you choose to take it a little slower, we've got the Columbus crew, who got a new ownership group right at the end of 2018. Tim Bezbachenko took over both business and sporting side mm-hmm. right after that. And rather than be uber aggressive and kind of jump in front of things, they took their time. They got the lay of the land. They struggled, admittedly, in 2019. And now it looks like they're ready to make their largest signing in club history. 27-year-old Lucas Zellerayan out of Tigres. He's originally from Argentina, but he's been in Mexico for the last three years. The reported rumors numbers is between seven and eight million dollar transfer fee. Their highest in their club's history was Pedro Santos for two million. So it would be quadruple what they've done. They've also signed a center back in Vito Wormgor out of Norway originally, but from Holland. But let's start with Zellerion because this is one of those signings, Dolan. We've talked about it a little bit this mm-hmm. offseason. It's a guy that you've wa- we've all watched and yeah. enjoyed not thinking what would he look like in MLS, and now all of a sudden that name falls down, and you're like, this is a legit Tigres player. Yeah. I mean, he's been a starter for the most part on what I think has been the team of the decade in North America. This Tigres, I know they still haven't won an international tournament, <laughs> but they've won you know more Ligias than anybody else, and they've I think they have the best record in, in Mexico over the past 10 years, which is pretty good um and he's been a big part of that since 2015 or 16 Mm -hmm. and he was at belgrano before that so you know starring in the argentine Primera, he's in his prime um he's not he's not a a a pure magician right like you're not gonna watch him and be like oh my god it's like watching raquel may all over again he's not like you know moro diaz was for fc dallas he's more of a modern player. He covers more ground. He can hurt you in more and different ways. And I'm curious to see now, because like he's such a hardworking number, he's almost like a number eight. I, I'm curious to see now um, what this means for how the crew play. Because mm-hmm. Caleb Porter, in his now six years in MLS, for the most part, for five of those years, he's had a counterattacking team. Played possession in 2013, but for the rest of it, it's almost all, I don't want to say almost always, but it's more often than not been counterattacking. But now with, you know, the, the two wingers they have, Diaz and Santos, with uh, Zellerayan, uh, with Nagby and Artur, and then Will Trapp, you know, probably, like, is he a backup at this point or is Artur? Like, this team can and maybe even should press. This should be a really front foot team because they just look like they are going to be miserable to try to play through. So we got an email from Dan in Columbus. I just want to fill in because you basically did seven of the 11 starting (laughs) spots there. Uh, He mentioned this starting 11 and he wants to know what you think about it, but it would be Eloy Room in goal most likely. Um, Milton Valenzuela, who was originally a designated player signing at left back. He's still only like 20? 21, 22, yeah. And... Missed all of 2019. So alone they were going to upgrade this year because he was going to return. Harrison Awful missed large stretches of 2019 as well at right back. You've got Worm Gore who just came in as left center back and Jonathan Mensah. I just want to say it's probably Worm Gore. You think so? Yeah, because he's Dutch. I know. But it's exciting to hear you say that because that's a great name. Okay. It's better than what I said. Worm Gore. Yeah. Both of them, both of them are strong. Okay, so it's an American worm. Goal. Yeah, worm goal. I just wanted him to welcome. I just want to welcome him to Ohio. The only way you can be welcome, which is mispronouncing your name. And then Jonathan Mensa at the other center back, most likely. I think most people are assuming Will Trap will start because he's an Akron guy. He's a Columbus. Played for Caleb. Yeah, and he's the captain of the team. Yeah, it seems like Nagby will start alongside him, and then the attacking front four that you mentioned with, of course, Jesse Zardes up top. This is. 
You don't want to talk about what it means in the East yet because you don't know enough about the Eastern Conference. Let's just start with this. This is exciting. Like, this would be fun to watch. If I'm a Columbus fan, this is a really good day. Yeah, I mean, I think that front six is invigorating and exciting within itself. I think, uh, I think Mac, you hit it spot on. You need to, you need a high press. Um, and it needs to be a kind of hybrid between counterattacking and, you know, that balanced possession style of play that, you know, I think Caleb wants to play. I think he prefer to play that way, but just – uh, being able to adapt in today's game and knowing what's effective and being being able to make those adjustments on the fly, um, but this the front six and for Zardes to have somebody to to link up with a little bit. He's not much of a link up player, more kind of getting behind. But I think he has shown that ability. Um, you know, coming uh, later last year that he's able to, you know, hold the ball up a little bit and, you know, connect with the attacking mid and that false nine. So I think having um, Lucas in there and then also having Nagby, I mean, Nagby, you know what you're going to get. Such a clean and consistent player, never loses the ball, uh, can spray the ball all across the pitch. Um, I think he's I think he's really going to be the true catalyst for this squad. If Porter's been there for a year and they sign this guy, he's got to be on board. Yeah. Like they have to play he yeah. has to be happy with what he, yeah, that style. Then no, I, I, I absolutely assume so. And like, look, Caleb Porter and Tim Bezbachenko have worked together in the past. They know. I, I think they they clearly have a vision, and they're clearly working together for it. It's an exciting. I mean, again, he was a starter yeah. for the best team in the region for years. He's also only twenty seven. Yeah, Quintero was a great signing, but Quintero was short term. This yeah. is a guy who can be around for four this or is, five years. This is maybe time. like this is it's very similar to what they had with Federico Higuain. That's and I assume they're they're very much hoping um that he is this era's Pipa or you know, this era's Diego Valeri. And I think you mentioned the style of player is lazy comp would be Maxi Morales, but it's pretty similar of a guy who changes the game by just covering so much ground, being clean, being, being smart, around man. everywhere, yeah. and also can finish. Yeah. Like, he can score when he finishes, it's going to look pretty, and it's going to be big. And then you've got the options outside of him that are going to stretch the field and get it wide, and you've got these fullbacks that are going to be now all of a sudden. I'm really looking, again, yeah, really looking forward players. to seeing Valenzuela. He would have been top five on, on 22 under 22 this past year if he had played a single minute. So, uh, so it seems like their starting lineup set. We talked about Arter maybe being available around the league. You'd think people would come and ask. You've got three legit center mids for two spots. So MLS, you need depth. No yeah. one has depth. Having depth is great. It seems like they have some okay depth at center back as well, bringing in Huberg, having uh, Abubakar Keita in the ranks already. But they don't have a backup forward. Kind of thin on the wings as well. They do have Hector Menace. So Are we giving up help. on J.J. Williams as a backup center forward yet? I mean, he had his, his first year, right? You're getting your feet wet. and like A lot of guys improve in year two. Scored a bunch of goals for Birmingham. Yeah, there you go. Um, so. Also, just to go back to Will Trapp as well and that talk about that that flux of center midfielders that they have, I think in years Will Trapp hasn't really been pushed in Columbus in terms of competition, so I think this might help kind of push him to the next level and having that competition and so many capable and you know, qualified uh, central midfielders in there I think is only going to elevate his game as well. And it'll be interesting to see what Nagby does back under Porter, back home. It's always everyone's always wondered what the buttons were to push with him to get the best out of him. You'd say probably his best time was with Porter. Obviously, he was with him for so long in Portland, and he's always wanted to come home. He's always wanted to be there. Now he's there. This is his team. Basically, we'll see what happens. I think it's an exciting time right now for Columbus fans. Let us know what you think. Of course, at Extra Time Radio, Extra Time at MLSsoccer.com for the email. We're going to be away, so that probably means we will be on the email like the entire time, and we'll <laughs> respond to every single tweet to the Extra Time Radio account because he's home with his family, and I don't know. He just that's what he does. Um, so it's a good way to un- unwind. Yeah, to get, for sure. To get deeper into the weeds of the internet and all the things that happen. Get there. abused on Twitter. It's perfect. It makes him happy. So. <laughs> we allow it otherwise we'd lock him out of the account but we can't do that because we love him so so much and we miss you andrew which he'll never hear about yeah no, definitely. uh are you guys ready to get even more silly because now we're gonna legit get into rumors there we go not reports go ahead you ready yeah rumors are in brazil that gremio which was a club that had already approached this or rumors had come out about this this summer has made an approach about signing permanently pt martinez from atlanta united it wasn't great in 2019. He was supposed to be the next Almiron. Rohn. It was tough. There was probably upswing towards the end of the year, which makes you think For sure. it'll look better next year. Any thoughts here? 
Uh, I tend to believe this one. I don't know these. I don't know these Brazilian reporters at all. But Gremio is a big club with a lot of resources. Um, they badly want to win the Copa Libertadores again. Uh, I and PT makes sense for them in a lot of ways. So I, I would not be shocked at all if this was legit. And like, but that side makes sense. The question is the other side. Atlanta United made a huge move in signing the South American Player of the Year. Yeah, did he look like the South American Player of the Year? Did he look like a $15 million player at any point? No, but many— You already have one guy on the roster like that. <laughs> no, I mean, like, Barco has a ton of talent and a ton of potential. He hasn't looked like a $15 million player. Like, if you want to win in 2020, like, maybe, okay— it didn't work with PT. Give him a move that makes him happy, and at least give Frank De Boer the chance to sign one of his a guy that he has his eye on as a DP. But to be fair, in the you know the the, the beginning part of 2019, Barco looked like the player that you know that we brought him in, that MLS brought him in to be, that Atlanta United brought him in to be. I thought um, I thought he was full of confidence before was it the U20 World Cup? I think mm-hmm. um, he he came back, he got hurt, and his his form dipped a little bit. I'm I'm on the fence in terms of I'm on the side in terms of give PT another year to really prove himself and to uh, be a little bit more comfortable in DeBoer's system. I think you know, like I feel like he probably heard everything from a lot of the of his teammates of how you know Tata played and the culture when Tata was there. So I think it was a lot of different you know external circumstances that might have you know formulated it into him not having the the season that you know everyone expected him to have. And obviously, there's huge boulders on your shoulders when you, you know, the, a club pays that much money for you. So I think, you know, given the time and the opportunity this year, I think this would be the year, or at least half of this year, to judge Petey Martinez on his on his performance on the field. Great thoughts there from Darius Barnes, legend who has now disappeared. He had to let go and uh, do real work, I think. Yeah, like a real job. Yeah, Darius is actually a suit. You might not have realized that because he was dressed so casually. He actually went into the bathroom and did a full Superman reverse. Wears a tie, yeah. loafers. Yeah. Looks good in them. He does. He's a former professional athlete, for yeah. God's sake. You know, every once in a while, we do this about the managers where what, do, like, who's best, mm-hmm. who's who's well dressed. And I think it's come up about Pep because he wore like the same sweater for like six straight months when last season with Man City. And it's mm-hmm. like, you know, why they're well dressed. Because they're in perfect physical condition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They could wear a garbage bag and it would look good. <laughs> right. But besides that, it was really nice to have Darius get some uh, North Carolina, you know, knowledge in there besides some our grits. F- I can't believe you've never you've said you've never had grits. That I liked. Huh. I've never enjoyed them. I in fairness have not spent heavy amounts of time in the South, although now I've been to Atlanta a lot. I don't really order it. Yeah. I was in Savannah, Georgia for actually the holidays two years ago, and me and my sister tried it a couple times. And one of the times it's like, it just, so is the point to just cover it in whatever you like? Yeah. I mean, it's a it, vehicle. It, it's like a better version of oatmeal. Like you could have savory oatmeal, you could have yeah. fruity, you could have sweet. Grits is that, I mean, I usually, like Darius, I usually go for savory. For savory. Yeah. Shrimp, I and, covered grits, mine. shrimp and grits is amazing. Uh, do you well, do shellfish? I don't, I don't yeah, you don't do shellfish. Yeah. yeah. But I covered mine in hot sauce, which I liked. Because I like hot sauce. Yeah, covering it seems a little extreme. Well, I just like to eat things that taste. Like, that's what I do when I do make rice and beans. I just cover it in hot sauce. All right. It's all a vehicle. Well, on that note, thanks so much to Darius for coming on. We'll have him back, of course, in 2020. We are very excited about that. But let's finish off some of these. I don't know if harebrained is what you'd call them. Well, it's silly season stuff. There there are rumors. Some of them, I think, will pan out. Yeah. Some probably won't. So this one's actually real. Mm -hmm. FC Cincinnati. This is a report. No. This is done. Yeah. Okay. FC Cincinnati signed a center back, Tom Pedersen, 29 year old, out of Oster Sons. Oster Runs? Any relation to Joel? No, but I, I'm i pretty sure they're the exact same person. Right. Tall, thin, center back, white dude. Um, he is 29. Uh, my birds in Scandinavia have said this. Good, very smart player. Confident on the, on the ball. Strong ball winner and reader of the game. It'll be interesting to see how he adapts to what they do. And I think we saw this in the comments from FC Cincinnati front office. They said he's going to be a guy who helps us build out of the back. Patterson, Vanderwerf, Kendall Waston now. And they still have Nick Hag- Hagland as well. So, like, they, they have their center back rotation. Um they obviously still have a lot of work to do, but I don't think they're going to give up 75 goals again. And it seems like it will be five at the back, right? Does it? Oh, you don't think so? I'm not sure. Interesting. Um, 
it can't be worse than what it was last year. <laughs> and I think there's an idea of like getting veterans, getting settled guys who, as you said, I mean, it could won't be give up it could be like a five four one, but I think a a four three three with Madunian in as the back point, and then get two really hardworking, you know, kind of number eights in Alan front Cruz. of them. Yeah, Cruz and Bertoni, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not going to be pretty, but you know that Madunian is amazing at getting wingers into space yeah. to do damage. So I, I honestly think it's going to be defend with seven and attack with three on the break um, into space, and I think that that's a step forward for Cincinnati in 2020. We have another official signing, I believe, in Francisco Guinella, uh, officially signed by LAFC out of Uruguay. We sort of mentioned it last week, 20-year-old center mid Mm -hmm. from similar pipeline to what they've been using with Rodriguez and Rossi, and you mentioned this with Palacios. As a good team, they continue to amp up, but also it seems like prepare for what is probably the departure of one or two of their center mids. Yeah, it seems likely that Edouard had to, like, I know for a fact that he's attracted overseas interest. Um, it, will they hang on to him this winter? I think so. Uh, but will they sell him this, you know, next summer? Right. I think so. And, and when that happens, you have the plug and play replacement, just like Rodriguez is the plug and play re- replacement for Rossi, who I think will be sold this winter. Really? Still? Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Um, I'm shocked that Mark Anthony K is not getting more talk, by the way, because he is so good. And he, because he changed positions, mm-hmm. I understand he's quote unquote older for development, yeah. but he's just learned what he's done and he already does it at such a high level. And I think he still has steps to go, but whatever. I mean, it, would, it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me, but also bear in mind, like there's a market for Colombians and Uruguayans and Argentinians. Mm-hmm. There just isn't a mark. Like if you sign a Canadian or American player, uh, you you have to explain yourself to your fans in Europe. You don't have to do that. Oh, I can explain you. There's a nice little clip from Alfonso Davies yesterday of him basically tearing through three quarters of a yeah, Bundesliga lightning, team man. and setting up Lewandowski. So we'll see what happens there. Um, LAFC, it feels like they're pretty steady for what they'll be next year, but continuing to add pieces. An interesting report coming out of Mexico that William Yarbrough, who is, of course, a U.S. national team goalkeeper, born in Mexico and had been playing for Leon for the last few years, won a title with them. Um, He could be on his way to the Houston Dynamo as he seems to have been replaced at Leon and is available. We haven't heard a ton since Darwin Quintero and obviously Tab Ramos taking over. Um, Yarbrough seems like would be competitive to be a starter in Major League Soccer. And for Houston, how much more building are you looking at there? I don't know if it's a lot because if you look at – like they're obviously going to add a few pieces, but – Matias Vera is coming back. They still have Thomas Martinez. They haven't made any news about moving him on. Um, I do expect Mauro Minotas to be sold, right? But you we can't... haven't heard anything. No, we haven't. That might change in, in 12 days when the window <laughs> opens, though. Um, but, like, even if they sell him, they still have Christian Ramirez, who scored 15 goals in MLS a couple of years ago. So, like, they they have a, a deeper team than I think people realize – the question is, can Tab Ramos get sort of instant chemistry for this team? Mm-hmm. Because they had they had that at the start of last year, and then they immediately lost it. Uh, and the other thing is, like, how good can Albert Elise be? Um, we thought he would be better by now, right? And in big games, it seems like for a lot of teams, your ceiling is determined by how good your best player is. And Albert Elise was really good at times, but he he wasn't he wasn't that good often enough. Yeah, it seems like what Tab wants to do should unleash him in that high pressing, having a way that they play that fits what yeah. at least is good at. He's not good when teams sit back on him and he has to create spaces out of yeah. against a set defense. We'll see. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting year in Houston. In Orlando, Oscar Preya has a lot of work to do, not that much time. We've heard some rumors about a center forward coming from his former club in Colombia, an Argentine center forward, and not sure if that will come true. A new rumor here is Antonio Carlos, a 26-year-old Brazilian center back currently at Palmeiras, who would be on a one-year loan, which mm-hmm. in my mind, center back is the first thing he needs to do. Mm-hmm. He needs to fix, so this makes sense to me. Yeah. Even I- if it's a one-year fix you just need to start at that spot absolutely and you know Palmeiras has been one of the two or three best teams in Brazil for the past couple of years so like if they're willing to loan him out um that doesn't necessarily mean that it's because he hasn't made it it means like this is 
a guy with experience at a top, top team in a very good league. So it would make a lot of sense. The other thing, RSL getting Zach McMath for 50000 in in GAM, that feels like the right move from them. and Just to have options to replace Ramondo? I think so. Yeah. Because I like David Ochoa a lot, but he's 18. Not sure if he's going to be ready to step right into the starting lineup. Yeah. Putna had good moments last year, but you're not sure he's a starter. Zach McMath, um, I think a lot of people have felt for the past couple of years that he was a starting caliber keeper. Um, he'll get a chance to prove it this year, it seems. Uh, they also re extended Aaron Herrera, which is a big move for them because yep. that puts them in control of a player who. I think is going to be borderline national team over the next few years. I mean, he should get injured. He should be their Tony Beltron for this for the, this decade. I think he might be a guy who leaves, but you, they get something from him. All right. Well, Everything I've heard from people who work with him think that he is the best that's come out of the RSL Academy in a while. All right. I mean, he had a really good year. I I don't know if I see that ceiling for him, but I'm I'm willing to reframe my view uh, based upon how 2020 goes. Uh, it should be an interesting year. A lot of different stuff going on. Last little bit of news. It sounds like Lucho Acosta, his time in Major League Soccer is done. He is heading to Atlas in Mexico. Although the report came out from Steve Goff, who's pretty accurate on these things, that he had negotiated with two Western Conference mm-hmm. MLS teams, which would have been a fascinating way for this whole thing to end. Yeah. is for him to stay in the league and DC to so- kind of actually get something for him because they control his rights in MLS. And for him to still play in MLS would have been odd. It it would have, um, it arguably would have made more sense. Uh, it's our good buddy uh, Pablo Mar from the Athletic, another Athletic plug. Um, Pablo deserves it after the week he's had. Yeah, he's had a very good week. He's had a thirst quenching week. <laughs> um, Pablo saying that is ninety nine percent done. That he that mm-hmm. Lucho goes to Atlas. Atlas is a graveyard, man. <laughs> <laughs> like is Rafa Marquez still playing? He's not. Okay. But Atlas haven't even come close to a title in 20 years. Yeah. Um, and they haven't won a trophy of any sort in, I think, half a century or something like that. Um, and I think the stadium's falling apart. Yeah. Because Chivas left. Yeah. It's not It's not a Lucho, not a we move. loved you while you had. we had you. You're welcome back anytime, whatever happens. Let's finish off with a few mailbag pieces. Chad from Texas, who mentioned... A few weeks ago, our CCL fever seemed to be in full effect. Here's his Tylenol to bring down our fever. LAFC has been terrible in knockout games so far. What makes you think they'll perform better in CCL? It's home at home. So rather than one game knockout, they have a little more breathing space? Yeah. Although they've lost at home in knockout games. (laughs) They have. No. Do do they fit the Liga MX style? No. Because if you look at Liga MX teams, the ones that have dominated – well. Monterey, certainly, it, when they, they dominate MLS teams, it's like we're defending with six and we're attacking with four. We're not overlapping. We're not. We're just going to turn you over and then we go. And that is actually kind of kryptonite to yeah. LAFC. Um, so, I like, I just in terms of stylistic, it, it could be a struggle. Um, but in terms of talent, this team is... I still think they're legit, and I still think they have a chance. And cohesion. not yeah. No changes really outside of the fullback spots necessary, which means the rare time like we saw with TFC, the team from last year goes straight into yeah. next year. You don't need to reset yourself. We'll see what happens. And if they sell Rossi, they will have that open DP slot. And I've said this before. I think that they should go out and get a high-level center forward. It would be fun to watch. It would. It's going to be fun to watch anyway. I'm pretty excited with the schedule out. So much to look forward to in 2020. We, of course, will be back early on in 2020 with all of our shows. We love all the participation we get in the mail. Weeby's been trolling through the YouTube comments. Does your family blow it out for for Hanukkah? No, that's not a thing. Yeah, I didn't think so either. I'm offended by it. I had to watch a Lifetime movie about Hanukkah and Christmas, and Uh I was offended the whole time that they were comparing the two. But... On Sunday, I get to eat latkes, which are fried potatoes, Yes, which is real. Do you do, you do sweet potato latkes? Mm, not when we do, like if I'm yeah. at a restaurant and being fancy, but not at home. We do zucchini sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's potato. Come on, man. All right. It's fried. It sticks to your sides on the inside. It's Keeps good. it warm throughout the rest of the winter. It is going to be good. What are you looking forward to? Uh, Just a week off, man. <laughs> just, just a week to relax. There. And cap this time. By a Liga MX final. Yeah. Liga final on the 26th to 29th. It's a nice little... Like, and we saw what that Monterey team can do against Liverpool. Yeah. Like, they went toe-to-toe. They should have won that they game. They should have won that game. Yeah. And on that note, 
almost there, but not really in international soccer. That is the story of ETR. That is the story of our lives. 2019 was a fantastic year. We thank you all for watching, for joining us, for myself. Oh, for... we didn't cover the Bobby stuff. Next time. Okay. For myself, for Anders Aarhus, our fantastic Swedish producer, director, promoter, every little thing. Matt Doyle, Andrew Weeby, Bobby, Kalen, Susanna. Cast now, of thousands. Darius. We've got so much You mentioned stuff. Carlos? Our guy Charlie yeah. back there? Yeah. Uh -huh. he, he keeps it all together, even when it's all falling apart. Like right now. Thanks to everyone. Happy New Year. Have a great set of holidays, and we'll see you in 2020. We'll be right